Hello, my name is Dr. Ashwani Raj, but I'm the director of the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Thank you for listening to my podcast and hearing about all the great things that are going on in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, 2023 represents the 50th anniversary of the Kimmel Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. And you can learn more about the amazing breakthroughs that we've been a part of in advancing cancer care at hopkinscancer.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast wherever you're listening from. Today, I have the distinct honor of welcoming Maureen Ume um, to our podcast. Maureen is a news anchor and a reporter for Fox 5 here in Washington, D.C. So it's a little ironic and I'm a little nervous that I'm interviewing the interviewer. You're welcome, Maureen. <laughs> it is my honor and my pleasure to be here, Dr. Ash. Uh, thank you for inviting me on the program. Super. And Maureen is not just a, a reporter, but she's also invested in the community and has a great interest in health equity and health care. And so I wanted to have a conversation with her today. But to start off, uh, Maureen, you know, people see you on TV and reporting the news, and we probably don't realize what goes into um, putting a news story together. Um, so can you describe for us what a typical day is like for you? Um, it, there's never a typical day. It's putting the news together is really a team effort. So for some someone like me on my anchoring days, I come in well before the newscast airs, and I work in collaboration with the producer, uh, talking about the stories we want to cover that day in terms of having reporters go on and, and cover it, and then having it in our rundown. We talk about uh, how much time to get that story because in news, TV news, you live and die by rundown. So every story has an allotted amount of time which you have to uh, meet in order to heat, meet these uh, meters that determine uh, whether you know you make your advertising block, which is how we make money on TV. So there's a lot that goes into it, but there's never anything as a typical day. You can have a perfect rundown put together and then there's breaking news and all goes out the window. And you just have to just go off script for however long your newscast is or however long that, that uh, situation is happening. So nothing typical about a day. It's really a collaborative effort. Anchors work with producers, work with managers, work with reporters, work with photographers, all of us working in concert to just bring the viewers what's happening in our neck of the woods from the most mundane to the most serious. We cover all of it, again, to make sure that our audience is informed. Sure. So it sounds like you have to have the ability to pivot pretty quickly if oh, you yeah. need to. Oh, yeah. So Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the, the name of the game is you have to really just be flexible. Uh, one day I may be called on to be a legal expert. The next day do something uh, medically related. The next day I'm on a cooking show. So you really have to be flexible in our business. Super. Well, you talked about, you know, informing the viewers and sharing information with the viewers. What types of stories um, do you really enjoy sharing your, with your viewers or what do you feel most passionate about? I think stories that make a difference, particularly to immigrant communities, which I'm very vested in. I'm an immigrant myself. My family immigrated here from Nigeria when I was very young. Uh, but stories that that resonate with immigrant communities, because I do know that a lot of times those communities don't have a voice or don't feel like they have a voice. And as someone who's been in this business for many, many years, I feel that I've built a platform and I like to use my platform to give those communities a voice. So the stories that I'm most passionate about are stories that I see that make a difference to people who feel disenfranchised in any sort of way. Uh, and they don't have to be immigrants. I just, I'm, I, I like telling stories that affect humans and the human condition. So whatever I can do to help make a difference, those are the stories that I enjoy the most. Wonderful. Well, you know, and I think that's what brought us together is we've had opportunities to talk at some uh, uh, functions. And so, you know, you're aware that at Johns Hopkins and at the Kimmel Cancer Center, um, we're really trying to grow our footprint in D.C. Um, to bring the Johns Hopkins medicine to anyone who needs it in our communities. And what we see in D.C. are some significant disparities in um, cancer incidents and also cancer mortalities. Um, you talked about issues that come up in the immigrant community, and I'm an immigrant as well, so I can uh, appreciate that. Um, what problems have you seen in either access to care or disparities, especially in cancer care? And what have you done to use your platform to impact for the good? Yes, unfortunately, for some in the immigrant community, community, I'm talking specifically about the African immigrant community, 
a lot of them don't know what's available to them. First of all, when some of them are diagnosed with cancer, to some of them, it's it's a death sentence. It's taboo. Why did I get this? And so the first course is prayer, uh, if they even share it with anyone. So there's a secrecy a veil, a, a, a put upon them about, I have to keep this a secret. I'm going to pray it away. And so they don't seek the, the care that's out there that can help save lives. So a lot of times they're presenting third stage, fourth stage cancer where it's, it's too late. And so this is a community where awareness and education is so vital because they're dying of diseases, not just cancer, other diseases are very preventable, but for lack of knowledge, uh, they're dying from it. And so where I got involved, particularly with the board I serve on, the African Women's Cancer Awareness Association, I got involved sort of as a, I was asked to host an event. I went to that event and I saw these young women, one in particular stood out to me, a 24 year old named Debbie, who was a stage four. Debbie was so full of life, so vibrant. And um, when she told her story, she's only 24 years old. She had been diagnosed maybe two years before, didn't tell anyone, um, thought she could pray it away, didn't want her father to feel that she was a failure. By the time she finally said something, it was it was late. And despite that, she held on to so much hope and so much faith that she was going to be okay. And listen to her story, even to the very end, Debbie believed that she was going to be cured and she'd be okay. But then she became a real advocate for prevention and, and for awareness. And I thought we need to spread that. Her story needs to be heard because how many more women, even men are out there sharing the very same experience, afraid to talk about this, afraid to let anyone know. And then I found out it's not just in the African immigrant community, Caribbean people experience the same thing. And that there are other immigrant communities where having cancer is viewed upon as some sort of a curse. And so they don't seek the help they need. And it's heartbreaking. We know that there is research, there is prevention, there are trials that these people can be part of that they're not because they simply don't know. And they're simply stuck in a mindset that this is a disease that was put upon me because of something either I did or my family did. Uh, so helping to dispel that, helping to change that narrative, those attitudes, that's what I want to help do through my work and my platform. That's amazing. And, it, and it's so impactful to hear that story of, I think her name was Debbie, you said, yeah, the, Debbie. Young, the young woman. And, you know, so in that's many so cultures, we find that Talking about cancer is taboo. And in some mm -hmm. cultures, you know, if you talk about it, you get it. So, of yeah. course, you don't want to talk about or talk about screening and prevention. How can we use these platforms and how can we move within the communities to raise the awareness and education that uh, this is not a curse, that it's one preventable, two very treatable for a cure in early stages? How do we do that? I think it's simply talking to people, talking to them, not at them. A lot of times, you know, and no offense to you, Dr. Ash, but doctors can be, and my doctor, my, my father's an oncologist, too technical. You know, we need someone to talk in layman's terms, to, to meet people where they are. A lot of times we use big words, fancy words, we want to show our education, show our knowledge. It's not that. Sometimes people just need you to come down to where they are to say, listen, I get it. I, I do stories like Debbie's sharing that, letting them know there are resources. If you're afraid, it's okay, my sister. I see you, I hear you. You know, I went through this or I saw something like this. Letting them know you understand where they are on that cellular level so that you're not talking down at them or talking at them, you're talking to them. You have to let people feel that they matter, that you hear them, that you see them. Because when they feel as if you're this authority kind of talking at them, people tend to close off. They're not as honest. Um, they don't share with you the full details of what they're going through. So I think if, if we aim to make a difference, we have to meet people where they are. Going into these communities, whether it be through their churches, whether it be through women's groups as they're sitting around talking and even, even hair braiding shops. You know, I, I get my hair braided. My daughter does too. You have a bunch of women sitting around just kind of talking about random things. Those types of environments is where you go to, to start talking. And it's not necessarily, uh, I'm, we're here today to talk to you about cancer. It could just be, hey, did you get screened? You know, I went and got screened. My doctor said at this age, we should be doing this. Have you done your breast exam? It's very simple, just in the shower. Simple dialogue like that, meeting people where they are. It doesn't have to be these huge campaigns. Sure, those are good. I don't, I don't mean to negate those, but we have to look at 
talking to people in the way that they understand, in the language they understand. That's where we make the difference. That's so important is, you know, what you just said and how we communicate our message. Mm -hmm. And being in the community then also, we want to engender trust, right? right? I think the community needs to be able to trust Mm -hmm. um, the providers or the healthcare institution that we really have their best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you, you have to trust is the cornerstone of what we do. If they don't trust us, they're not going to listen to us. They're not going to seek the help they need because already they are coming from a position of something's wrong. I've done something wrong. And if you put yourself in this position of, yes, you did, you should have done this. And why didn't you? People close off. And it's, it's, they go into their shells and they just accept whatever they think it is, their death sentence, and they don't go seeking the help they need. So we really have to be open. We have to find different ways to talk to different communities. And I think that comes from knowing the communities. Just because you're from one ethnic group doesn't mean we all speak the same language, so to speak. You know, we have to learn how to speak to people where they are and make sure we're making that difference uh, where it matters not from this level of authority where we're talking at them. We have to talk to them. That's where it makes a difference. Sure. Maureen, earlier in our conversation, you alluded to the African Women's Cancer Awareness Association. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization, your involvement with that group, and what the mission is for that organization? Absolutely. I've been with the group was formed 20 years ago, the African Women's Cancer Awareness Association. It really is that. It was founded by a woman named Mrs. Ifi Wabuku, who was a nurse. Um, she saw the need in, a, in the African community, immigrant community, and no one was doing much, she felt, to address the needs specific to that community. Too many women who weren't getting the screenings they need, who weren't getting the help they needed in terms of uh, medical attention. Um, and because she had been in the medical field, she knew that there were resources out there. So how do we spread this word? And she didn't just see it happening here in the States. You know, in Nigeria, she'd go back home where she's from, and she would be seeing that play out as well. Why are these women dying unnecessarily? They're, they need to get screenings. They need to know. So that's where the awareness part of the association comes in. And so 20 years ago, she started it really out of just her desire, her to do something, self-funded. Um, and till this day, a lot of it has been her taking money out of pocket to help these women, getting them to trials, to getting them to doctor's appointments, buying them groceries, helping them with rent. I came on board as the board director three years ago. And again, it was because of my involvement, hosting events, going to events. They eventually asked me to be on the board, which I accepted. And then as, as things would happen, because I guess of my passion for it, they asked if I would be the board chair. There was a vote. I I became board chair. Um, and it really is a labor of, of love. We don't, this is an organization that I, I tell people we operate on fumes, quite frankly. We host fundraisers uh, twice a year to really just make money so that we can run the office. And when I say run the office, it's really, it's a skeletal crew. We have maybe one staff person who makes a nominal salary. We have interns here and there that come in and volunteers. And then board members, you know, people hear you're on a board and they think, oh, you know, it's this lush position where you're paid and, you know, there are perks. No, the board we serve on, we are hands on. Every board member, there are five of us. We have specific tasks related to, to our, our profession. We have two doctors on board, a, another one who's a social media marketing, a planning event person. She does all of our events. She's tasked with nuts to bolts, the program. The, the, the acts, the everything, that's what she does. Me and the media, I'm tasked with that. Uh, finding sponsors, all of us have to find sponsors. Uh, getting media coverage, helping to draft documents. So it's, it's all hands on deck and we do it all because we care. And we know that if we don't do it, it presents a gap that the clients we serve will fall through. And so we have to do it because we've seen the need firsthand. It's needed, there's no one else meeting it. And if we don't, the fear is that more women uh, will unfortunately have a diagnosis that's that's unfavorable. And so we aim to, to prevent that by just playing whatever part we can play to make AWCAA a success. You alluded to something that's really important is, is the financial toxicity that comes with getting a diagnosis. So it's, it's just not, you know, do you have insurance? Can you get right. care? But once you're diagnosed, you know, th there's food insecurity, there's barriers in transportation, and there's a lot of literature, actually, with 
you know, loss of income or the financial toxicity. So this organization that Ms. Ify started um, seems to be addressing those areas of need as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, every aspect really, in fact, it, it addresses uh, things we shouldn't be addressing because again, when you gain the trust of, of people who, who feel like they can't trust anyone else, they share with you so much more. So we're finding that they're not just ill, uh, their, their issues within the family, their children may be in, in having difficulty. So we really take on the role of an all-encompassing um, agency that helps them sort out their lives. It's not what we intended to do, but we realize that that's the offshoot of perhaps a cancer diagnosis or, or, or battling this disease is that other aspects of your life suffer. And if we don't help you, at least steer you in a direction to help you with that, you know, we're, 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 what are we doing? What are we doing? Because you're not going to feel like you, a lot of people are selfless, even within their own cancer diagnosis. They, they still want to make sure their family is first and served. So if we don't make sure that that's happening or at least get them on that track, forget about treating them because they almost just, they, they shun treatment until they know that their family is going to be okay. Sure. So Maureen, we talked about, of course, the organization is a Women's Cancer Awareness Association. But within the immigrant community and also in under, underserved populations in DC, it's an important issue for men as well. Right. As we see that, you know, the common cancers, the big common cancers in DC, of course, are lung cancer, um, breast cancer in women, um, colorectal cancer in both men and women, and of course, prostate cancer right. in men. And there is a significantly higher mortality rate for those men that are diagnosed in specific wards that are east of the Anacostia River versus Northwest DC. Right. So is there work or efforts we can do to reach out to the men in the community as well? Absolutely, you know, the men are, are not exempt. Again, reaching the men is similar to reaching the women. We have to meet them where they are. It might sound very sort of uh, simple, but barbershops, um, you know, sporting events, we have to talk to men where they are and let them know, hey, it's okay. It's okay. You're not alone in this. You, you're, not, you're not unique in, in wanting to seek help or seek uh, more information. So again, it's talking to them where they are and letting them know that it's not, it's not something to be afraid of. People you know, people who look like you have gotten this and have survived. So talking to people where they are, letting them know that it's not anything to be afraid of, Maybe even talking through the process, if you go to a prostate exam, here's what you're going to ex expect, because there's all this folklore out there of what happens and sure. the pain of it all and, and what it's like. And if you get diagnosed with this, you know, that this happens and there are all these myths out there. So talking to them about the reality of it. And, and, and you know, a lot of times, sometimes it just it has to be coming from someone who looks like them. Because as much as you may have a heart for something or I may have a heart for something, some people you just hear better from someone who looks like you. You feel like they get you better. So we have to be cognizant of that to say, maybe I'm not the best messenger in this community. There's someone else. So having a robust team of people who really reflect the community from a racial makeup uh, standpoint, that's very important. Because as well-intentioned as we are, we simply know that People are creatures of habit. People like to, to, to congregate in groups that mimic themselves, look like themselves. And so having someone who looks like them, talks like them, can be more effective than, say, someone like me or you trying to talk to a community that we don't necessarily reflect. That's very important. And, you know, we do recognize that. And um, we're trying to actually build a network of peer navigators mm -hmm. uh, within the community. So um, it brings up two important things that you talked about. One is that it's someone like me, someone who understands me, understands my culture, understands my background, who's going to potentially help me get through this. And two, the important thing is with um, people who want to serve as peer navigators who've actually had a cancer diagnosis themselves yeah. and then come through as survivors to say, Look, you can be a survivor too. Indeed, that is so important. That is so important to have people who walk the walk, talk to talk, to be part of the process. Yeah, Maureen, what brought you to Washington D.C.? Because <laughs> we're lucky to have you here. Oh, well, thank you. Do you want the real story or what I tell people? <laughs> yes, and yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't. This is the wrong podcast for that. What brought me to D.C.? If I'm being really, really honest, I was trying to get an old boyfriend back. Uh -huh. I didn't. I know. 
I didn't I didn't win him back, but just as dumb luck would have it, the news director at the time at, at, at Fox 5, I knew her when she was in Baltimore. She wanted to hire me then. And so maybe naively, because it doesn't happen like this. I, I came into town. I didn't get the boyfriend back after many attempts. I quit my job. I was a, a main anchor in South Carolina. Quit that job. Made the guy I was dating then. Moved me up here. Talk about chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> This podcast has just gone left field. But anyway, um, I didn't I didn't get him back, but I got the job at Fox 5 and I haven't looked back. It just was one of those weird things. Didn't get the guy, got the job. Here I am now. I've done amazing things. This this was not supposed to be home, but it is now. I have a daughter, a family here. And so it's it's been a weird and crazy ride, but I wouldn't change it for the world because you know, every every everything that happens, good, bad, ugly, it it helps shape who you are and helps your path cross with so many incredible people. And here I am today, so I'm grateful. Well, that's wonderful. Again, you know, we're really glad to have you here. Thank you. You know, both in the media and in medicine, um, we reside in environments that are quickly changing. And of course, you talked about how you have to pivot on certain days. But how is your job changing overall with the times and where do you see your role in the media going? Oh, goodness. That, that's a good question. And really the million dollar question, because media is changing so much. Mm -hmm. Social media is where it's at now. So traditional news, as, as I grew up doing and, and in this business, is becoming uh, more and more rare. It's we're not appointment TV anymore. People don't make the five o'clock news, uh, you know, the morning news. It's not appointment TV. They get their news from their cell phone. And social media drives that a lot. And so we're having to pivot in the sense that we have to make news entertaining in that way. So where folks want quickly, just information headlines, our newscasts have to reflect that, the way we give them news, where we give them news has to reflect the, today's lifestyle. So that's changing a lot. And with that comes um, the look that they want. They want younger and younger means cheaper. So those of us who've been in the, I call it the game for a long time, we're finding that the salaries we once commanded no longer are there. And so you have to justify why am I being paid this? And so every contract negotiation, it's it's very tense because you have to justify why are they paying me that? And they ask, well, you know, I, I'll take the chance and hire someone who's younger and cheaper, may not know as much as you do, but they'll get there eventually. And so a lot of stations are taking that gamble. And so you're seeing younger, cheaper. Some of them are good. Some of them not so good. But that's the trend of TV. And in my opinion, uh, that's where the erosion of trust has come in because you're asking people who are younger, not experienced, um, not as learned uh, to, to take on heavy weighted topics that you really need people with a breadth of knowledge to, to um, handle. And you're not seeing that as much. So you have the misinformation. You have... Uh, interviews that don't quite go the way you want. And so people have this mistrust of the media because again, it's been so diluted that once we, we used to be the gatekeepers of information uh, and the people who were the beacons of light that shine light into dark spaces and were truth keepers, that's no longer what we're viewed on as. And that's, it's disheartening. Uh, so what I aim to do is with my platform to, to reestablish that trust. And in doing that is really by turning it back to people to have them be their own griots, their own storytellers. Let people tell their authentic stories undiluted. What matters to you? So for instance, when I bring it back to healthcare and we're talking about cancer, letting people in their communities tell us what they want to see, share with us their struggles, their pains and, and things of that nature and tell these stories in a way that yes, it's compel compelling, but it comes from the people directly. It's not filtered through me. It's not filtered through a, a TV network or, or a conglomerate. It's told directly by the people how news used to be. So hopefully returning to that, we can gain, regain the trust of the audience and really present journalism in the way that it should be presented and the way it was meant to be presented. Wow, you said so many important points there, and I just want to reiterate some of that. One is the power of social media. Mm -hmm. Right. And you talked about disinformation, whether it's in the mainstream media or in social media. And I loved how you brought that back to health and how we might be able to use that platform to really get messages out in the community. And would that be an effective tool, Maureen, using social media in, let's say, the immigrant population or in underserved communities? And can we use that in a trustworthy way to mm -hmm. get our message out to the communities? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you, if you look at the most, they can call it a third world country, but everyone has a cell phone and everyone's right. on Instagram, Facebook. They're, they're there meeting people where they are. If they're on, on social media, there is, that's where we reach them. It could be a 10 minute, a 10 second blurb. Have you been screened today? And with someone saying it in their language, I was screened and it saved my life. It doesn't have to be these complicated campaigns. I think sometimes we, we overthink things. It could just be simple blurbs where we're saying something, but everyone's on, on something all day, they're on their phones, you know, simple, simple things that help make the difference. Because if you hear a message enough, it sticks. I mean, that's the beauty of advertising. I do marketing. You say something enough. If I tell you enough, the sky is red over and over again. You initially might doubt me. Then after a while, you're like, you know, I can, it's a pink has changed. They're not wrong. You start believing it. But in this case, we're talking about something that can save your life. So social media campaigns, using that, that's where people are. They're not doing traditional media. We need to go to social media because that's where people are getting their information from. So why not use that as the channel to which we disseminate the information we want them to get? I think that's so true because uh, not only keeping it simple, but we yeah. got to keep it short, right? We don't need <laughs> yes. an hour long lecture. Yes. We need that, that yes. rapid fire scroll through, but yep. not get the yep. message, right? It's the kiss rule. It's really keep it simple, stupid, but keep it short. Keep it short. The kiss rule, it applies. Well, Maureen, I can't thank you enough for joining me today and making the time to be with us to get these important messages out. Um, where can our listeners find you on social media? Oh, goodness. So you had to ask that. So I, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. On Twitter, I'm Maureen Ume Fox 5. On Instagram, I'm Maureen Ume TV. Um, I have to be honest, though. I haven't been as active as I should be on social media, but I, I'm rebranding and retooling. Uh, AWCAA, is, it's at AWCAA. That's the Instagram account. Uh, and we're also on Twitter, AWCAA. Uh, please, if, if you're within my earshot and you're listening to this podcast, look us up, see what we're doing. We're constantly fundraising. If anything I've said today resonates with you, please come on board. We need help. Uh, we, we welcome divergent voices. Just be there and know that your voice and your actions can help save a life. That's really what it's about. And so if we work in concert, we can really make a difference. And I, I really, really believe that. Well, thank you again. I look forward to continued, a continued partnership with you and the communities that we serve uh, to build a healthier um, community in D.C. for everyone. So thank I you again for making you. the time. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Ash. Awesome. Continue success to you and anything I can ever do to help you along and, uh, and, and, and Johns Hopkins, please, by all means, uh, let me know. We will be reaching out to you again in the future to do that. So thank you again to all the listeners for joining us today. Again, you can subscribe to all of our podcasts for the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center, wherever you are listening, or by visiting hopkinscancer.org forward slash podcasts. Thank you.